Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our book talk. My name is Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director here at the Harvard Law School Library. I really want to thank you all for joining us today for a great discussion on tough cases that judges have to decide. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our dean's office for providing lunch, and please eat your lunch during our discussion. I also want to let you know that copies of today's book are available outside of the room, so after the talk, please feel free to purchase a copy. Um, I also want to let you know that, that today's talk is being recorded both by the law school and by C-SPAN, so any questions you ask will be recorded. So now down to business, I'm going to introduce all of our panelists and try to get off the stage as quickly as possible because you want to hear from them, not me. Um, judge David Barron is a circuit judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit and the Honorable S. William Green Visiting Professor of Public Law here at the law school. After graduating from HLS in 1994, Judge Barron clerked for Judge Stephen Reinhardt of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and Justice John Paul Stevens of the U.S. Supreme Court until he joined the Office of Legal Counsel of the U.S. Department of Justice in 1996. Judge Barron became an assistant professor here at HLS in 1994 and was promoted to professor in 2004. He returned to the Justice Department as acting assistant attorney general from 2009 to 2010 before rejoining the HLS faculty until he was appointed to the federal bench in 2014. Nicholas Bowie is an assistant professor of law here at HLS and a historian who teaches and writes about federal and state constitutional law and local government law. Professor Bowie also litigates appeals for the Committee for Public Counsel Services, the Public Defender of Massachusetts, and serves on the board of Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice. Professor Bowie received a BA in history from Yale and a J JD and PhD in history from Harvard and has clerked for Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and Justice Sonia Sotomayor of the U.S. Supreme Court. Andrew uh, Manuel Crespo is an assistant professor of law here at HLS teaching criminal law and criminal procedure. His research focuses on the institutional design and administration of the criminal justice system, looking especially at the administrative role courts play in regulating law enforcement behavior. Before entering academics, Professor Crespo served as a staff attorney with the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, representing adults and juveniles charged with serious felonies. He graduated magna cum laude from HLS in 2008, where he served as the first Latino president of the Harvard Law Review and went on to clerk for Judge Stephen Reinhardt of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and Associate Justice Stephen Breyer and Associate Justice Elena Kagan of the U.S. Supreme Court. Professor Charles Freed is the beneficial professor of law and has been teaching at HLS for some time. Um, from 1985 to 1989, Professor Freed served as Solicitor General of the United States and then as Associate Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts from 1995 to 1999. He has taught a wide range of subjects, including criminal law, commercial law, torts, constitutional law, and federal courts, and appellate and Supreme Court advocacy, and authored many books and articles. Professor Freed has also argued a number of major cases in state and federal court during his teaching career, most notably to law students who've taken evidence, Daubert versus Merrill Dow, Dow Pharmaceuticals, in which the Supreme Court established the standards for the use of expert and scientific evidence in federal courts. Judge Nancy Gertner retired from the federal bench in 2011 and is currently a member of the HLS faculty teaching a variety of subjects, including criminal law, criminal procedure, forensic science, and sentencing. She is a graduate of Barnard College and Yale Law School, where she served as an editor on the Yale Law Journal. Judge Gertner has also been an instructor at Yale Law School, teaching sentencing and comparative sentencing in institutions since 1998. She was appointed to the federal bench by President Clinton in 1994 and was only the second woman to receive the Thurgood Marshall Award for the American Bar Association Section of Individual Rights and Responsibilities in 2008. She has published articles and chapters on sentencing, discrimination, and forensic evidence, women's rights, and the jury system, as well as her autobiography, In Defense of Women, Memoirs of an Unrepentant Advocate, which was published in 2011. Judge Frederick Weisberg, the editor, one of the editors of today's book, was appointed to the Superior Court of the District Court um, by President Carter in 1977 and subsequently reappointed by President George H.W. Bush in 92 and President George W. Bush in 2007. 
Judge Weisberg received his law degree from the University of Michigan in 1968, where he also served as notes and common editor for the Michigan Law Review. Prior to his appointment to the Superior Court, Judge Weisberg worked with the Public Defender Service in DC as a staff attorney for three years before eventually becoming the Chief of the Appellate Division in 1974, supervising all appeals handled by PDS in both the DC and U US Court of Appeals. Currently, Judge Weisberg serves as a chairman of the District of Columbia Sentencing Commission. And then I'd like to turn it over to our moderator. Martha Minow served dean, as dean of Harvard Law School from, nine, from 2009 to 2017, is the inaugural Morgan and Helen Chu Dean and professor, and is currently the 300th anniversary university professor. She asked me to be brief, so I will just say that she is, was a wonderful dean, is an amazing professor, a great friend of libraries, <laughs> and um, I'm a big fan. And I will turn it over to you, Professor Minow. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you so much, and, and thank you to the library for sponsoring this and so many other terrific events. I don't think that everybody in the world has always focused on judging as an important task. It's a really important task. And in recent uh, weeks in this country, more people, I think, are paying attention to what makes a good judge. This is a case about hard cases. And I commend it to you all, and I want to thank one of its editors who's here, Judge Weisberg. Thank you so much for your work putting it together. It's unusual to have judges speak so candidly about cases that are hard. And I'm asking a question of each of our panelists that's a two-part question, which is, Describe maybe one of these chapters that spoke to you and what you thought made it hard and uh, whether you think that there was more to be said. And also, does it make you think about a hard case that you were involved in either as a judge or as a lawyer? Um, and uh, let me just note one more thing. The judges who are writing in this book reflect many different actual posts. Some are trial judges, some are appeals judges, some are dealing with criminal cases, some civil cases, some very high profile cases whose names you probably know, others names that no one knows. And also, some of them are elected judges and some of them are appointed. So the context for making the decision varies for each of them. And with that, David Barron, Judge Barron, would you start us off? Uh, thank you, Martha, and thanks everyone for coming, and to Judge Weisberg for putting together uh, the book as a sitting judge. It's it's um, not maybe the reading you'd want to do in your spare time, <laughs> but it's it's really quite powerful for those of you who haven't read it to hear the judges engaging with what the process of making a decision is in a very hard case. And just one thing that really <laughs> struck me, and I wonder if um, Professor Fried will have the same reaction. As an appellate court judge, it's just such a different job than the job of being a trial judge. And, and overwhelmingly, the focus of the book is on trial judging, which doesn't get the attention that it should in the way we teach. But the thing that comes through again and again is the isolation and loneliness of the decision maker who's a trial judge, which just is not true of an appellate judge. In fact, you know, it's often said about appellate judging that it's a monastic uh, inquiry, at least you're in a monastery. The trial judge is literally alone in making these decisions, and, and strikingly, in some of the chapters, the judge even goes out of his way to isolate himself further, not even to talk to fellow colleagues or even clerks uh, in, in one of the cases uh, about the decision that he has uh, to make. So that feeling of the pressure of uh, decision is in some sense familiar to a sitting judge, but in some sense uh, foreign, uh, because you don't have uh, the ability to, to share uh, with other people in the inquiry. The other thing, though, that, that did come through for me is there is an advantage that a trial judge has over an appellate judge, which is the prospect of review, which in some ways does take the pressure off by design in the system. I mean, the decision has to be made, and it's going to be reviewed. Now, I don't think that they love review, <laughs> I'm but, looking at me, is that right? <laughs> you're, I think you were looking at me. <laughs> but there is a certain uh, dynamic to that, and I, and I do think as an appellate judge, when a case comes to you in which the prospect of review, because of the way the case arrives, is minimal, and you know you're the last word on it, that has a pressure on you as a decision maker that's uh, unusual. The last 
thought that I had is something that comes through in the discussions by the judges, which I think may be hard to appreciate from those looking in at judging. Over and over again, these very hard cases, the judges emphasize how clear the decision was to them by the end. And I think that's a very common phenomenon, it, at least it's been a common phenomenon uh, for myself. Sometimes in cases that seem hard on the outside, it doesn't mean that you're not aware of the responsibility that you're bearing in making the decision, it doesn't mean you're not aware of the consequences, it doesn't mean you're not aware of the criticism, but oftentimes it actually isn't hard in the sense of being unclear to you what the right answer is. Sometimes it's, it's quite easy to see to yourself what the answer is, even though you may recognize others would disagree with you for yourself as the judge. It's just evident what the answer is. And when I was in the government and having to make decisions, this really came through to me. I'll just close with this point. The idea that you might be pressured to do something that you don't want to do, I think is less, should be less of a risk. And in my experience, is less a risk than you might think in the sense that when the decision seems clear to you, there's just no way you can be made <laughs> to do it otherwise. You, you couldn't write it a different way. It just doesn't seem to you that it's possible. The really hard cases, in my experience, are the cases when it's just not clear what the answer is. And that can happen in any type of case. It can be a low stakes case. It can be a high stakes case. But when it happens, it's very difficult because you just, you truly don't know what the answer should be uh, in such a case. And not all those cases are tough in the way the book is describing tough cases, uh, but it's a distinct kind of right. toughness. Thank you. Professor Boyd. Thank you. Um, and hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to read this fabulous book. Uh, thank you for putting it together. Uh, it was such a thrill to get all these different perspectives on cases that I had read about in many cases in the news or had uh, known a little bit about, especially like the Terry Schiavo case, and just knowing the bits and pieces of it without realizing what in fact was the legal decision at stake in a case like Terry Schiavo. So I, like many people in 2000, was aware that there was a woman who was in a persistent vegetative state um, and there was a controversy over whether um, a, the tube that, that was feeding her should be pulled or not. And it was a controversy that involved Congress, and involved the governor of Florida, and involved Florida courts. But it was not clear to me at all as an observer what is the legal question that the court had to answer. And so seeing it from the perspective of the judge, as Judge Barron just said, uh, he describes it as a very easy decision. that. The legal standard was um, essentially whether her husband, or whether she had communicated in advance what she would have wanted. Um, he did a hearing and concluded that she had communicated several times that she wanted to have her feeding tube pulled if she was ever in this situation. And that, as far as he was concerned, was the legal test that he had to answer. But what made it a difficult case was everything else involved that had nothing to do with the legal doctrine. And I think that was a theme throughout all of the cases in this book that what makes a case tough is not necessarily the sort of you know, legal puzzle that you have to fit together or that we as professors ask in hypotheticals, you know, what if it were slightly different or what if it were this way, but rather knowing what the answer is in your mind, how do you grapple with the consequences of that in the real world and with other people? Um, the other thing that really stood out to me about this book was the sense to which what made a question hard or easy had a lot to do with the culture in which judges came from. So several of the judges talk about their experience as advocates, particularly as public defenders, having to switch from an advocacy role of always favoring the criminal defendant to a sort of impartial judge role, and how that isn't so easy as flipping a switch, and it's not even clear what impartiality means in that context, because it's impossible to make a decision without thinking about past perspective and you know, what you as an individual brings to the table. Um, so I, it's, it's a little odd for me to have been invited to this panel considering I've never been a judge. Um, but I think one case that um, I read in the book that made me think of cases I've been a part of as a clerk um, was sort of indirectly uh, Judge Edward Wilson's example. So Judge Edward Wilson is a 
state court judge from Minnesota who was invited to participate in an international tribunal overseeing Kosovo um, during um, the UN oversight of Kosovo after the civil war and genocide that took place there. And he describes how he would see a case that from his perspective seemed routine. So for example, a person in cold blood just shot another person knowing that they were gonna kill the other person and so it was first degree murder, easy case. And he remarks how in any state in the union that would have been an easy call for at least life in prison um, but also probably in many cases the death penalty. But interacting with all of these other judges from other um, systems, uh, particularly from Europe, all of these European judges thought, you know, you don't sentence this person to life in prison, you sentence them for five years. Five years is obviously the appropriate sentence for this sort of behavior. And he couldn't believe it. And so he tried to negotiate down from life to 15 years, and they're like, no. <laughs> and eventually they settle on seven years which from his perspective is like far beyond what he would have put if he were in charge. But I think it speaks to the sense to which culture and where you come from really sets in motion what will seem like a hard or difficult case. And so when I was clerking for Justice Sotomayor, the hard cases were not the sort of puzzles that the Supreme Court um, always grapples with every year, but rather the routine cases that the court receives every week in the form of death penalty cases. So uh, it, there's a list in every chambers in the Supreme Court of people who are scheduled to die uh, for the next two or three months. And so every week that name gets closer and closer to the top of the list. And by the time their cases reach the Supreme Court, they've usually exhausted all of the legal puzzles involved in their, dis in their cases. And they're throwing out anything that can possibly get to prevent themselves from dying. And when I was working for the justice, there were cases in which the Pope intervened to say that um, you know, this person had been rehabilitated. There were cases in which um, someone who was on death row uh, had lawyers who refused to represent him before a clemency <laughs> panel because they thought that he had no chance at getting clemency. And so the question before the court was essentially, given that clemency is a discretionary appeal for um, someone, there's no guarantee of clemency, what does it matter whether your lawyers file for clemency or not. And so it was something of a difficult legal question, but it was also just a really easy moral question of surely if you're on death row, your lawyer should not abandon you. But the court, even though it's so powerful, is not in a position where it can just decide on a whim what it wants to impose, especially on state courts. And so I found that tension between the court's power as the Supreme Court and its inability to really help people who needed that help was just incredibly difficult week after week, even though the legal puzzles involved were not so tricky. And I felt like that sort of tension really came across in this book, even though it focused, as you said, on trial judges. Thank you. Professor Crestwell. Well, thank you so much, Dean Minow, for inviting me to be on this panel and to the authors and editors of the book, which, as everyone has said so far, is really uh, fascinating. I don't think that I've ever really heard um, judges speak publicly or write publicly about their thought processes in tough cases the way that this book captures. Indeed, having even clerked for three different judges, it's sort of rare to hear judges even speak privately sometimes the way that this book captures. One of the things that really stood out for me reading it was the way in which it underscores something that's probably obvious and perhaps even tried to say, but the extent to which judges are human beings while they're going through this work. Something that comes through in a lot of these chapters is the emotional toll of the work, the challenge of having to deal with things like sadness or anger or humor, uh, but needing to present a sort of the face of justice and therefore not being able to uh, react to emotions the ways that people might always uh, or naturally react to, to, to their own emotions. And a, a related theme that came through was the extent, uh, as Professor Bowie mentioned, that Things outside of the actual four corners of the case might influence the way the judges feel. One thing that came through in the book to me was the extent to which judges seemed concerned about um, their self-perception and their reputation. Um, and perhaps something that I hadn't quite ever thought about before reading the book was that there seemed to, in some of these a difference actually between the big cases and the small cases in this respect. I think a theme of the book is the extent to which judges, after they've made the decision, when the decision seems clear, the, the extent to which they're able to stand up to pressures that are external. Uh, 
I think each of the authors of these chapters thinks about judicial independence as something very important. And you see examples here of big cases where the judges sort of cast themselves and describe themselves with this, this brave face against the world. Some of these judges were standing up to governors, presidents, popes, Congress, uh, and had to make decisions that those actors thought were unpopular. And the, the, the image we get from the book is the, the way in which they're able to resist that pressure. Something that was striking from the book was the extent to which, for some of them, they were candid about how pressure was sometimes harder to resist in smaller cases. How they would be open about the fact that they wouldn't want to be considered, I think one of the quotes was, a judge said that she was worried that a certain decision would make her seem like a weak, bleeding heart jurist unfit for the bench. Uh, others talked openly about being perceived as defense-oriented in criminal cases. This sense that a certain decision might have an immediate uh, uh, sort of impact on their, their, their professional circle, their, their, the people who they interact with every day in the courthouse uh, or in the legal community. Um, and you know, one of the chapters that jumped out at me in that respect uh, was the only chapter in the book that's written by a judge who I've actually appeared in front of. Uh, so that's Judge, judge Russell Cannon uh, on the DC Superior Court. So it's perhaps natural to me that this case would jump out because it was also a criminal case. Uh, and when I practiced in that courthouse, I, I, I represented criminal defendants. And the case struck me as one where it was at least possible that this dynamic, this sort of, um, the pressures of how a decision will be perceived within, within the immediate community might actually make it challenging for a judge to read a reach a decision that they think is, is the legally right decision. Judge Cannon describes this case as one in which he said, quote, I had crossed a line to do the right thing. The title of his chapter is Rough Justice. And I'll just sketch for you briefly the dilemma he was facing. He was presiding over a criminal case and he was convinced that the defendant was innocent. He also, based on notes that the jury was sending back, really thought the jury was just about to convict this person. And that if the, if the defendant was convicted, that Judge Cannon would have to impose a mandatory sentence, sending him to prison for a long period of time. So Judge Cannon's really struggling with this. Um, he says, I believed he was innocent. I could see a miscarriage of justice coming. So his response is that right before the verdict is issued, he calls the lawyers in, the prosecutor and the defense attorney. And he says to them, essentially, you know, I think we can see the writing on the wall. And he says, I strongly urge both sides to consider a guilty plea. And he was basically trying to get them to agree to a guilty plea that would not have that mandatory minimum, a lower charge, so that the defendant wouldn't necessarily have to go to jail. <laughs> but Judge Cannon is really forthright about there being at least two problems with this way of sort of solving the dilemma he's confronting. He says it was, um, First off, a problem in that the result seems at best rough justice. He says, look, we're going to get to the right result. This person will be found guilty but not go to prison. But even that result, he recognizes, sits a little bit uneasily because he thinks the person is innocent. So having the person be convicted and be branded forever as a criminal is still not perhaps the best um, outcome here. And then he also says the rules in his particular jurisdiction say that judges are not supposed to involve themselves in plea bargaining. So he felt uneasy about even going just the sort of small step of calling the parties in together and say, look, why don't you think about a plea bargain? Taking all this together, he says that he felt that he had scared the defendant into pleading guilty to something he didn't do, that he crossed the line to do the right thing. That is to say, to avoid making this person go to prison for a crime he didn't commit. But one of the things that jumped out about me from this uh, chapter was the extent to which it was a little bit puzzling what exactly the dilemma was. Because one of the striking things here is that the rules of criminal procedure in, in every state allow a judge to find the defendant uh, not guilty, to essentially enter a judgment of acquittal if they decide that no reasonable jury could find the person guilty on these facts. That is to say, if the judge sitting there sees the case and thinks there's no way any reasonable jury could convict, they don't need to wait for the verdict. They can actually just say, not guilty, case over. And Judge Cannon talks about this. Uh, and people who look at the facts of this particular case might come to sort of different views about whether that's the legally right response here. But one thing that jumped out at me was how Judge Cannon himself described the dilemma. Because he says the reason he was so conflicted 
was that he thought, how could the jury possibly convict the defendant? Most of the time I agree with the jury's verdict, or if not, I understand how they came to their conclusion in a rational way. I could not understand this one, though. Which at least suggested to me that he thought there is no reasonable way for a jury to return a conviction here. And so he perhaps was at least tempted by doing that, uh, that, that motion for judgment of acquittal, saying, look, the way to solve this dilemma is not to encourage the defendant to plead guilty to something he didn't do, but to find him not guilty of that. And it at least seemed to me possible that a challenge here is that it's not just that the legal standard for entering a judgment of acquittal is very, very high, but that there's a cultural pressure about these sorts of things. And he speaks openly about that in the book, about how the real norms are that this is a big, bold thing to do. It's something that would be talked about all through the courthouse. It would be this very salient type of decision. And that it may be um, less uh, fraught to call the parties in and say, look, why don't we just see if you can, can resolve this? And one of the things that I just really appreciated about the way that this chapter was written was that Judge Cannon is um, open about feeling like he was flirting with the line. He says, I, I crossed the line, I came close to the line to achieve rough justice. Uh, and in so doing, he really put open for the reader the extent to which I think he was struggling between a choice that might have been potentially on his own account of the case, sort of a legally sure-footed way, just sort of enter the not guilty judgment, and an approach that he, f and that he felt he couldn't quite take, he couldn't do that route, uh, and as a result was, felt himself drawn towards something that was more of a, of a rough justice approach. And uh, having, having practiced before Judge Cannon, I just wanted to, to say how much I appreciated the way he put the difficulties of that, the real way he struggled with the case into such a, a, a poignant chapter uh, that captures for the reader some of the difficulties he was, he was, he was grappling with. As um, Professor Minow says, you know, tough cases for law clerks uh, are nowhere near as tough as they are for judges, and especially at the appellate level. So I didn't have any that were anywhere near as close to the chapters in this book. The one thing that jumped out at me was simply the difference that's already been mentioned between trial judging and appellate judging, and how many times what these judges were dealing with were not close questions of law, but really questions that were about discretionary things left to them, how to sentence someone, uh, where the answer is really just committed to them and their judgment. And seeing the way that they grapple with that was really a, a, a gift of the book. Terrific. So Justice General Professor Freed. Well, I appreciated this book because uh, it led me to see uh, one or two roles within the legal system that I've not occupied. Uh, Solicitor General and as, a, uh, uh, as an advocate and as a judge, and mainly as a teacher. I keep returning like a bad penny to that. Uh, We're lucky. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, what David said, David Barron, Judge Barron, uh, said was only partially so. Uh, he speaks also from the perspective of somebody who has only been an appellate judge, uh, that, uh, that somehow uh, being an appellate judge is not that lonely. You always act uh, in concert with uh, two or, uh, in the case of the SJC, five, or in the case of the uh, Supreme Court, eight other people. That's you know, not all that lonely. Uh, now, the trial judge, in a sense, yes, he's lonely, or she is lonely, but on the other hand, uh, the trial judge is dealing with real people, sees the people in front of her, uh, the expressions on their faces, they are not abstractions. Uh, they, uh, they are uh, completely concrete, and that is an enormous difference. Uh, the uh, person whose life the judge is about to change, one way or the other, is looking right at her, uh, and you've got to have the something, the ability 
to look right at somebody and say, you are going to go to prison for the rest of your life. Uh, well, uh, that's an experience, David, that you and I uh, do not have. Now, uh, lonely it is, but isolating, not entirely, because you're not isolated from the actual human facts of the decisions uh, that, uh, that you make. Now, that leads me to understand also something else, why it is that with a certain relief, I left the appellate bench. It's something I, uh, people ask me about a lot, and I don't always think about, but uh, a book like this makes me think about it. Uh, and what occurred to me is this, that as an appellate lawyer, uh, you have a, uh, with a case, you, may, I, you mentioned the Daubert case, for instance. Uh, I was just the uh, lawyer for that in the Supreme Court and then on remand in the Ninth Circuit. But I lived with that case for something like two years. The judges and the justices in that case may have read those briefs the night before, may have talked about them with their clerks or may not have, uh, and would spend a lot or a little time writing the opinions, but it would be gone and would be swamped by uh, 18 other cases uh, that would come up the next week or the next month. Uh, and it's that immersion uh, in a case that uh, I missed as a judge. Uh, I also have, you have some of that as a law professor. Indeed, I mean, the great thing about a law professor is you can get as immersed as you think your audience will tolerate. Uh, and that can be quite a lot. Uh, or you may be mistaken about whether they're tolerating it. Uh, those are all, so those are all different uh, roles. Uh, somebody once explained the role of the appellate judge as somebody who comes down after a battle is over an officer and shoots the wounded. Uh, <laughs> Doesn't sound like an appellate judge said that. <laughs> uh, now, as to the particular cases, I was very struck uh, by Andy's talk because I too uh, was struck by Judge Canton's uh, case. Uh, and I reached a somewhat different, uh, not, a, uh, not, not a contradictory, but a different conclusion. And that is that our legal system is, uh, our criminal law system is in some respects defective. In other legal systems, uh, the British legal system, for instance, the judge is much freer to come in and say, no, uh, this, is, this person's innocent. Uh, the, the judge's discretion is much larger. Uh, and so the judge in that kind of case would have felt much easier about intervening. And I can't help but believe that makes more sense. And I think it's true in one way or another uh, in, uh, in the continental legal system uh, also, but I don't know that as well. The other conclusion that one is led to is uh, the enormous injustice of mandatory sentences, mandatory minimals. Uh, it's fine to have guidelines. I'm a believer in guidelines. In fact, I argued for their constitutionality in the Supreme Court, and I won uh, that time, but, I, but that case then was overruled. Uh, but the guidelines do provide and should provide for 
the possibility of departure, all the way indeed, uh, with review. You've got to give reasons and with review. That is a rational system. Uh, mandatory minimums preclude that, and uh, that is a very bad, uh, a very bad feature of our criminal justice system because Judge Cat could have solved his problem another way. Uh, he could have let the jury reach its conclusion, though he disagreed with it, uh, and then uh, imposed a sentence of probation in a rational system. And he would have to give his reason. And among his reasons would be his great doubts about the guilt of the person. And that would be right up there, and he wouldn't have to have played this game. Thank you. Well, now we turn to someone who was uh, very much a trial judge, district court judge, and who is writing a book about the experiences, particularly with regard to sentencing. So, Judge Gertner. Thank you. Um, uh, this was, it was very interesting to read this for many of the reasons that people were uh, describing. And clearly, the most compelling chapter to me was also with respect to Judge Kane. And the rest of the story that, that Professor Crespo didn't describe is that after the judge got the plea bargain, the defendant was crying in the courtroom and outside the courtroom uh, when he, before he came in to plead. And again, that's the notion of the context that the district court judge would have seen. The guy would be coming in teary. After he pled guilty, the judge found a note that the, ju the jury, the juror, the, after the guy pled guilty, the, was it, the jury had announced a verdict, but before the verdict came in was when the plea colloquy took place. And after the plea colloquy, the judge found the note indicating that the jury would have, that the jury had acquitted him, uh, which is, uh, has got to be the most devastating feeling of all. Um, and then there was a motion to set aside the plea, and the judge at that point agreed to set aside the plea because he concluded that he had coerced the plea. And when he set aside the plea, the government dismissed the case. So there was a lot of sort of machinations that would have, uh, he could have avoided if he had entered a verdict of acquittal. Um, a part of the, he doesn't talk about that specifically, and I, I know that that was a power of the district court judge, and in some sense it is a lawless power, because it's a lawless power in the sense that once you, uh, at the close of the government's case, uh, put in a verdict of acquittal, there is no appeal. So it's not just the culture of the courtroom, it is an enormously lawless power. You understand that you have really put your thumb on the scale in a determinative way. So he didn't talk about that very much, but, I, but that was always in the back. I think I did this maybe twice in my career, 17 years on the bench was a directing a verdict of acquittal. It, you know, under circumstances where I may have disagreed with a verdict because I felt it was not just the culture of the building and it was not just the criticism, but I felt that this was uh, um, unfair to the government to do it in that, in that setting. So that was, that was the most compelling, uh, gut-wrenching uh, chapter. It also raised for me an interesting question, which is all of the judges here, and particularly the one judge who had been a criminal defense lawyer who talked about the dual, it was almost just a dual consciousness with which he approached the, the, the job, which is I know what the judge requires, the, the role of a judge requires, but I had been this other person. What do you do with that consciousness? And what was so interesting is that um, all of the judges had a sense of what the law required and backed off and what they thought was fair. And the dual consciousness is, gee, this is what the law requires, this is what I think is fair. And that's a terribly, I thought that was a terribly important consciousness to maintain on the bench, not just in sentencing, but in anything. It was a way of measuring the fairness of the rules you were obliged to, to, to um, apply. Dual consciousness was not just uh, from the perspective of a defense lawyer, but also um, the, the, the comments in here about how it would look if I did X or Y as a, as a woman judge. One, one case was a woman judge who was accused of 
uh, being biased against uh, male defendants. Um, um, and yes, I thought about that as well. I thought about it not in terms of whether, you know, people would no longer have lunch with me. I thought about it in terms of my legitimacy. I cared desperately that what I did on the bench would be seen as legitimate by the public I served. So that would be also a part of dual consciousness, uh, thinking about the legitimacy of your decision. The other thing that was interesting in here, which I felt acutely as a district court judge, and actually Martha has written about this and we have talked about this, is choice is everywhere. That is to say, judges will, by the time you've come to a decision, you'll say, I have no choice but to do X. And, and, um, but in fact, there were choices at every stage. How much process to give? How, much, how many days of hearings? How much uh, uh, briefing to allow? Um, uh, oftentimes, it was over and over again, choice with respect to procedure. One judge talks about how, uh, he would give process and that would somehow relieve him of the obligation of considering whether it was the right outcome or a wrong outcome. Actually, not true, since the process you give oftentimes will determine the, the outcome. How you decide and when you decide will determine what you decide. So they, all of these judges were describing the choices that they were making at every stage of the game, which is terribly important to come to grips with and which determines outcomes. We've also been talking about hard cases and easy cases. The thing that drove me the craziest, well, there are a lot of things that drove me crazy as a judge, but one thing that drove me crazy was the, 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 the cases that were defined as the hard cases would be you know, case challenging the constitutionality of something or a high profile case. Those are the cases that came in with substantial resources, amicus briefs, lots of attention, and everyone gave you time to decide it. The cases that we labeled easy were oftentimes the hardest for me because they were the cases that were only easy because the law had gone in a direction unexamined for you know, years that was not necessarily the fairest direction. Habeas cases were in that category, which was uh, the procedural tripwires to get to the merits were oftentimes arcane and troubling, and I wanted to examine them. If I had to, if I, you know, if the law required I do X, I did X, but I did not want to leave them unexamined. And that was sort of uh, Professor Crespo's description of the of the death penalty cases in the Supreme Court. You know, you could look at that and say, this is going to be a loser, but I, if death is in the balance, I want to examine the unexamined premises of that. Um, so uh, what seems to be an easy case uh, at first glance, maybe, or may not be, and maybe it shouldn't be an easy case. In my uh, book, I'm writing about the men that I sensed and uh, how, they, uh, how I was obliged to see them how I in fact saw them, the facts that I brought into the balance that were not under the guidelines, uh, what I was obliged to do, and now looking back, how they should have been treated in a humane system. And it is an excruciating process. Um, the, uh, the hardest case though, and all of, the, all of the, virtually all of the guideline cases and mandatory minimums I regard as hard and excruciating because the things that, in my view, mattered were not in the mix. Addiction, mental health issues, background were not in the mix. Um, but clearly the hardest case for me was when out of the gang crack cases came a death penalty case, where the gang was the racketeering enterprise. Um, and all of a sudden, my concerns about mandatory sentences, my concerns about guidelines were just exacerbated. Um, and that was the case that they had questioned me about when I was a, uh, in my confirmation process. That was, of course, you know, you've been an opponent of the death penalty, could you impose it? And I said yes, and I meant it. But what does it mean to be a judge in a death penalty case? How deeply, what kind of process do you give? What kind of care do you take to make sure it's the fairest possible proceeding? And that's what I tried to do, uh, make sure that everything unexamined had been examined and make sure that I could um, 
and, and make sure that it was the fairest possible process, understanding that if, after giving the fairest possible process, I had to impose the death penalty, I would. Uh, just to cut to the chase, um, uh, the premise of the case was that it was a racketeering enterprise, this loosely organized group of kids who grew up on the same block was a racketeering enterprise. Uh, in one of the cases in this group, the jury hung on that, on the question if it was a racketeering enterprise. And that's the second case in my career that I entered a verdict of acquittal. Uh, because if it wasn't a racketeering enterprise, it wasn't murder in aid of racketeering. The, these individuals were then prosecuted in state court where there was not a death penalty and were acquitted. Wow. And I have now been in touch with them. So um, uh, I'm not sure what that validates what I did, but I felt entirely justified in doing what I did. But the notion of choice is what I really want to underscore and which reflects reflected in this book. Well, thank you. Uh, and. I mean, we now are very lucky to have one of the editors and himself, uh, Judge, Judge Weisberg. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I found the comments of all my fellow panel members extremely insightful and, and learned some things about the stories that I had, ed in fact, edited that I hadn't mm -hmm. seen before. Um, not surprisingly, the case that spoke most loudly to me was the one that I wrote. Uh, which, I'm, which I'm happy to talk about uh, briefly. It's, it, it's, uh, it was a very hard case for me. It, it begins, uh, simply enough, with an eviction uh, from uh, a residence. And when the eviction crew arrives, they find uh, the tenant living there in an aban seemingly abandoned house with, on, in January of 2008 with no heat, no water, no power, and uh, f her four daughters, uh, the skeletal remains of her four daughters, who had been dead, it turns out, uh, we later learn, uh, for at least three months, and perhaps as long as six months. Uh, there were some difficult uh, forensic pathology issues in determining the cause and manner of death because the bodies were so decomposed, but the issues for me that were the hardest uh, were uh, all involved assessing the mental, uh, mental state of the defendant, uh, first uh, to determine her competency to stand trial, and then uh, with respect to the insanity defense, and it became multiple times more complicated when she was found competent to stand trial and promptly ordered her lawyers not to raise an insanity defense. Uh, and they disagreed with her decision, and they uh, advocated very, uh, aggressively that I should impose the defense notwithstanding her stated wishes and uh, that's basically what the story was about. Uh, the other thing that's in it is that uh, and, and, um, I went right to the brink of trial believing that, that I'd be okay because it would be a jury deciding these complicated issues and at the last minute uh, she also ordered her lawyers to waive the jury. So I found myself deciding the case without a jury uh, the government in, in our jurisdiction and in federal courts, uh, the government also has a right to, to insist on a jury even if the defendant chooses to waive it, but uh, the government was perfectly happy to accept the defendant's waiver and try the case non-jury. And so I, there may be other stories I don't recall in the book where the judge talks about the isolation of, of deciding, but this was one where I took the view and have always taken the view in my non-jury trials um, that just as we tell juries not to speak about the case with anybody, except with each other and then only in the privacy of the jury room when they're actually deliberating. Uh, I felt I should follow the same rule and I do follow the same rule. Most of my colleagues disagree with me actually. Uh, so I, I didn't talk to anybody about it, not people uh, intimately close to me or uh, even my law clerk. And I literally took the evidence into a jury room, empty jury room uh, for two or three days, which was both isolated and symbolic uh, and went through the, the evidence just the way I thought a jury would have done it, um, at least the way I imagined a jury would have done it. It was, a, it was an extremely lonely experience. And uh, anyway, I want to buy the book. You'll see. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I'd like to go back very briefly to two, two points that have been raised um, by others. Uh, first of all, Judge Barron's point um, 
one way or another, most of the stories in the book are about the rule of law and judicial independence. Not all of them, but the vast majority. And Judge Barron made the point that, that uh, and, and I hope I'm paraphrasing fairly, that actually, once you figure out what the right decision is, it's not that hard because there's no other decision one could make. Uh, that's what your oath requires you to do. And, and of course, that's absolutely true. But that's true because we're here. Uh, that's that's the, the beauty and the, the virtue of, of our system of justice. If you imagine the decision being made in Kosovo, for example, or in China, perhaps, and many, many, many other places, I think it would be significantly less true in terms of resisting the pressure from outside influences that want you to decide the case in a particular way, whether you think it's the right decision or not. Um, and then I want to pick up one last point that, that Judge Gertner made also. Um, it's personal to me. Uh, when I was appointed in, in 1977, uh, there had never been a public defender appointed to the Superior Court before. I had spent my entire legal practice in the public defender's office. Um, and President Carter and the people around him thought it might be a good idea if we tried that. Uh, almost from the day I got on the court, um, I was very aware of the fact that I was a public defender coming on the court. I was well received by m almost all of my colleagues, almost all of whom had been former prosecutors. Um, there was maybe one or two exceptions. Uh, I was also very young. I was only 33 at the time. Um, but I was very conscious of the fact that I, I was a former public defender, so it was not difficult for me to switch roles because I did it in a very conscious way. I, I, I deliberately tried as quickly as I could to find the middle, if I can put it that way. And about maybe six months, maybe a year into my time on the bench, the word began to filter back to me that the public defender's office considered me a traitor and the U.S. Attorney's Office thought I was a little soft on criminal defendants. And I figured that I was probably doing it about right at that point. And, and, uh, and since then, of course, there have been many, many more public defenders appointed to the bench, something I, I didn't do personally, of course, but I take some pride in. So that was... Thank you for that. You know, I'm struck by how many of you talked about the experience of the role as putting you in a in the question of how do you project the idea of being an independent judge, how do you deal with the appearance of legitimacy? And I'm reminded that there was a country after a civil war and a lot of violence where the judges were issued masks so that when they walked in public, they wouldn't have to deal with the violent reaction of the public for what they did. There's a kind of figurative mask that you have to wear as a judge. And I am very taken by so many of these chapters where the judges take off their masks and they tell us who they are and what it felt like. And, um, and that's one reason I really do commend uh, the book to you. But I also just want to elevate the idea of that role. It's a hard role that we ask people to play. Uh, and a role uh, not only of dealing with the intellectual puzzles that are often very hard, but also the public reaction, um, which may not always be uh, pleasing, or the reaction of the parties, the reaction um, of the community. I think we have time for one or two questions. Is there someone who would like to ask one? And would you identify yourself when you do so? A microphone is coming, so um, here it is. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mohammed El Shafi, and I'm a second year law student. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Well, among the very first cases that we took when we came to law school was the um, Erie case, Erie versus Tompkins. <laughs> and uh, an interesting aspect of it was that it seemed to overrule the the, the conception of um, the judge searches for law with a capital L, the omnipotent brooding um, law that uh, for which the judges are searching. Now that this notion that was once so common is overturned, that there is no law with a capital L. What has taken its place uh, for, for, the, for the judges of, of today? It's a very beautiful uh, question. I, I, I think, just to be fair, 
what the Supreme Court did was reject the idea that a judge sitting in federal court could simply discover what state law would be. And instead, that's a matter for the state courts to decide in a system of dual sovereignty where we respect the independence of the states compared with the federal court. And so at least I think it's fair to say um, that judges take their roles very seriously about what court they're in and what the source of the law is for the court that they're in. But maybe there's someone else who would like to comment on that. Uh, if not, let me see if there's one more question. One more. Then I will ask my closing question. Um, when a uh, judge reaches a decision, do you think that judges um, should actually share their feelings about it? Do you think that we would be better off as a society if there were regular reporting by judges of what they found to be hard or easy? Or should this be an exceptional moment of looking behind the mask? It should be exceptional, uh, just as any autobiographical or personal reflections should be very rare, uh, because they have the effect of uh, tempting you into making your own person the issue rather than the issues the issue. Judge Gertner. <laughs> um, I think that personal is the wrong word. Um, opinions reflect on the one hand, on the other hand, these are the things that I considered. I don't think that there's anything wrong in broadening that context and saying here's you know, the wider context. I saw the man crying outside. Um, I was concerned when I went on the bench whether or not I would, uh, you know, I should be sentencing people harshly to make sure no one thought I was still a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, I, I, I think personal in that regard of the things that you struggle with is not a problem. Personal, you know, in terms of what you ate for breakfast and get down to a certain, there's a certain point at which it, it's a different kind of issue. But um, I, I wonder if we are better off personal views of judges are being splayed on you know, television all the time and people are be judges are being attacked and, um, and the question is whether the best response to that is just to continue to be above it all or whether beginning to be give people a window into the difficulty of the job as this book does is a better way of enhancing that legitimacy. I have, I, I have a response also to that. When I uh, train the new judges, uh, as I do from time to time, uh, one of the things I always point out is that you get one chance to say what, what you did and why you did it, mm -hmm. and that's in the court on the record. And if you miss that opportunity, you're not gonna have another chance. Mm -hmm. So you should think through, before you're making a difficult decision, what you wanna say about it, because that's what the public is gonna uh, understand. I, I, I do not think judges, it's appropriate almost ever for a judge to go beyond that. Um, the virtue, or the, the, the nice thing about this, each judge that wrote in the book had to consult their own uh, state ethics board to make sure it was okay to write about the case. And in general, most of the states have the same guidelines. Um, obviously, you can't write about a pending case, and you can't write about a case that's likely to return. But if once a case is really over for all practical purposes, uh, the wraps are off, and you can write about it. Um, but it's always it retrospective. It, uh, it's not it, about why I did, did. It's a rule of no takes these backsies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Well, we're very glad that uh, you and your co-editors were able to find such uh, reflective judges and uh, who shared their stories with us. Please join me in thanking this panel. Thank you.